Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast, co-starring 10-year NFL veteran and Super Bowl champion, Will Blackman. Bending from the end zone, he throws, and it's a flight away, and it is picked off by Will Blackman, the former giant. Tim Dwight watches it hit, bounces, picks it up at the 10, slips a defender, fumble the football, it's up for grabs, it's covered in the end zone by Will Blackman for a Green Bay touchdown! And now, here is your host. Let's send it over to Rick Buecher. Rick Buecher. Welcome to another episode of Buecher and Blackman, subsidiary of Buecher and Friends, part of the United Wecast Network. I'm Rick Buecher. You can see me on FS1. You can follow me on Twitter, and you can read me at Bleacher Report. He is Will Blackman. You can see him on NFL Network. You can follow him on Twitter at Will Blackman. And uh, did I say you're a Super Bowl champ? He's a Super Bowl champ and doing a bunch of other things too, helping guys get drafted. Buker and Blackman are <laughs> helping guys get jobs in the NFL and whatnot. So, uh, man of many talents. All right. So, well, speaking on that, let's yes. speak on that really quick. So, um, I did help train a couple of guys we mentioned in a previous podcast, but so one of the guys I was training was Sean Bunting and he was definitely, you know, underrated. Not many people knew about him. And this was uh, presented to me by his agent Chase at Rep One Sports. And um, he said, what do you think? You know, what do you think about him? I think he's, you know, I got the report and he has watch his film. And I was like, this dude's actually legit. You know, you don't really see a lot of corners playing man to man in college. You see a lot of bail or pre, you know shuffling and mm-hmm. quarters cover three what have you and um then i worked them out i was like and this dude is like athletic like really athletic so i called a couple teams and you know mentioned him you know shopped his name around a little bit and i was just like man like this, this dude can really play what do you think so i i recently just spoke to a couple teams just talking about what guys i knew and lo and behold he was the number one rated corner on a couple of draft boards. Wow. He ended up being that by the time of the draft. So I was like, ah, oh, that was pretty cool. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. See, I wasn't kidding when I said that. How are you doing, by the way? By the way, this is, we, we are coast to coast. Yeah, we're, we're coast to coast. <laughs> we're, we're bi-coastal. This show episode is bi-coastal. I'm doing it from New York. I had the, I've only had one of the trips similar to this, but I had the trip from hell getting in here. Uh, as people across the country know, we got uh, some weather issues and New York got hit hard by weather issues last night and they closed the Newark airport twice and happened to close it just as my plane was trying to get in. And so we circled. It's super windy. Windy thunderstormy, rainy, you name it. But so we ultimately we got diverted to DC. Had to sit That's there. Awful. Had to get had to refuel. And this is a flight that was going to come in after midnight anyway. And then but it gets better. It actually gets better. But still this is where you came from. That's what was a pain in the butt. It was already a long ass flight yes, to Yes, be- it was already a 6-hour <laughs> flight. And it ended up being let's see. How long did it end up being? It ended up being over 12 hours. Yes, because we got we got diverted to D.C., and I don't want to belabor this for our listeners, but it was pretty comical because we got diverted to D.C., and then we finally got clearance to come into Newark. We come into Newark. We land, and the pilot says, um, so the, the gate that we're supposed to pull into has been hit, w- was hit by lightning. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So <laughs> there's a plane parked at it and they can't get it out. So we have to find another gate. So we're sitting on the tarmac waiting for another gate. And there was, you know, a lot of planes couldn't get in, a lot of planes couldn't right, get out. Right. So, I mean, the whole thing's a, a nightmare. So finally, they get us another gate and we get to the gate and we pull in. They can't get the jet bridge to the plane. They pull it out, and it's 10 feet away from the plane. And so it took them another, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes to get, to get that squared away. So uh, heck, of a, uh, heck of a trip, and 
as a result, I got in very, very late. I mean, I basically got in this morning in New York. But ready to roll and ready to get into a number of things. Uh, I didn't have to play. At least I didn't have to play double overtime like the Raptors did. Although that was a difficult thing too because I was on the plane and I couldn't get – we didn't have – Direct TV or any any TV uh, ability, so I was following it on the GameCast, where it, it just scrolls like play by play what was happening, and then texting with uh, Jason Whitlock actually, because he was watching it, and uh, it, it, it that's an interesting way that's an interesting way to follow a, a playoff game, I'll, I will say that. <laughs> um, so. The, the Raptors did what I thought that they had to do. One is make the game really ugly. Two, uh, give the assignment of slowing down Giannis to Kawhi Leonard. And the whole key with him, he's like, he is, to me, it's like a young quarterback. You have to, you have to disguise coverages. You have to confuse the floor. <laughs> you have to, right. make him, you make, have to make him read and react um, because that's still probably the biggest weakness in his game. And I thought that they did that. And... In some ways, that's good, that's good coaching. Yeah, well, I, and and it's interesting that Nick Nurse, the head coach of the Raptors, waited until Toronto to make that move. He could have made that move at any time. I think he wanted maximum impact, and that's actually a veteran move for a coach, rather than spring that on the road where Milwaukee is just a killer at home anyway. You spring that, it doesn't work. It's like, okay, what other card do I have to play? That's going to make my team feel like, hey, we've we've changed the dynamic here. But now they got a second game in Toronto, and uh, they really uglied it up. and And I think that's the way they have to play because what, this is the one thing I have learned about Milwaukee: they're a lot deeper and they're a lot better than I gave them credit for. Malcolm uh-huh. Brogdon is a nice player. Eric Bledsoe, George Hill, Brooke Lopez. I mean, go down the line. They've got more depth and talent around Giannis than I gave yeah. them. Yeah, and guys who have like quality starter minutes elsewhere. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's probably the thing that I overlooked is a lot of times when guys move around a lot, you look at it and go, okay, well, he's a journeyman. This is his level. We're talking playoffs. He's not, he's not that caliber of a player. But a lot of these guys are getting the first time to kind of shine. It's a little bit like Andre Iguodala with the Warriors. Right. Sometimes it's a matter of you just got to be put in the right role. Sometimes if you right. struggled before, it was because you were being asked to do too much. George Hill's not being asked to do too much now. At all. He has no stress. Even when he was in Cleveland, he had no stress. Well, he had stress because well, <laughs> LeBron well, decided to give him the yeah. ball in the, no, okay. in, the, in the worst situation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I give you that. Yes. That, that stressed him out. But that's, that's our point, though. He was, he was not the guy at all. And all of a sudden, in the key moment, yes. he had the ball in yes. his hand. Yes, and and that's <laughs> and that and something like that does color a guy as far as, oh, so this is who he is as a playoff player. He couldn't he couldn't make a big play in a big spot. Now in his defense though, I would be thinking like, okay, this is crunch time. This is definitely LeBron's time. Yeah. Like for no, sure. Like there is no way in hell I'm thinking I'm getting the ball. That's the way it should have been. That without right. question, that's the way it should have been. But the fact of the matter is, he was put in that spot and he didn't deliver. So you're thinking, okay, well, the Milwaukee Bucks were really good during the regular season. And the more playoff experience you have, uh, and I'm sure, I, I would think you experienced this. Like once you've played under the pressure of the playoffs, a regular season game has a different feel to it. Like you've gone to a higher stress situation, a higher exactitude in how you have to play, the time prepared, all of that. And then you go back to a regular season game and it's like, oh, this is, this is tough. This is, you know, there's, there's a lot I got to get done here. I'm not saying I would never say it's easy, but I've, I've, I've had to do something that was much more challenging than this. I think there's a comfort level that comes with it. Right, right. So... I'm trying to think now. You did you ever pick? I tried to push you to pick. I don't know make if a pick. I did. I don't know if I did. Who do you like? I don't know, man. I still can't pick. Oh my <laughs> goodness. I had the, look. I had the Raptors, but I like I said, 
I'm and I'm I'll be interested to see what happens. I want to see if they can sustain making Giannis a thinker and a reactor. Okay. Rather than just, you know, going at guys. And 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 if they can do that and then keep a lid on Malcolm Brogdon and uh, and George Hill as as well as playmakers. If there's anyone, because you mentioned to me, you know, like Giannis did look mortal. But if there's anyone that can, it is it is Kawhi. Yes, and I actually, you know? it's probably the best use of his energy because he's a lot like KD in that he's a matchup nightmare. So you want, like, if if, if you see him with a matchup. But the difference, though, is Kawhi has spots that he likes to get to. True. Well, uh, KD not- has KD has a couple spots. He just doesn't always like live on those because KD has KD is is confident as Kawhi may be. KD well, has. We the can ultimate. say that about every player, though. You know that they have spots, but I feel like KD can just let it go wherever. Yes. Well, and this is this was yes, but. There are certain positions you can put him in where the efficiency is much higher, and it's much higher for everybody else. Fair enough, right. Like you get him on the wing below the free throw line, and he's got one, two dribbles, either the baseline or to the elbow, and he can rise up and hit either of those shots or go all the way. Like that, that to me is the perfect place. On the right side, two, dribble, two, two left-hand dribbles to the middle, pull up or swing, drive to the baseline, little pull up right there, or he can go by you either way too. So, but KD has the mindset, I can score from anywhere. And he can, I mean, he really can. It's just a matter of what's better for the composition of the team. Because if, if one guy's out there, I'm going to score from anywhere, everybody else on the floor is like, okay, so where do I, where's the ideal place for me to be when he's doing that? It makes it a little challenging for everybody else. And that's, Kawhi does have his spots too. But the point for me is that neither of them is a playmaker per se. And so they get it. You want to give them the ball what you, because... What do, you, what do you mean by that? I mean I mean that when they get it, they are looking to score first and foremost. And if they don't score, they will give it up. But it's not that sweet spot of, I'm going to attack and then I'm going to instantly recognize where the best shot is. Either mine or somebody cutting or somebody out on the wing. Like a real point guard mentality, scoring point guard mentality of I can either score or I can find the easy the easy bucket with okay. a pass. Okay, that makes sense. Right. If they're, if it's not there, then they pass it to someone else yes. to facilitate. Yes. And where like give- Kyrie, every time Kyrie drives, it's either somebody's wide open or he's going to score. Yes, yeah. He's making a play. It's never like, okay, my ISO got messed up. I got to kick it to somebody else. Yes. Okay. That exactly. Makes sense. Exactly. They'll they'll kick it, but it's not like they're creating a shot out of that. It's they're they they're looking to create a shot, and if they don't get it, they'll move the ball on. But it's not because they hit an open guy. So uh, and look, there's exceptions to every rule, but by and large, that's the way they play. And the problem is that that doesn't get everybody involved. So right. That's where they're better with Kyle Lowry kind of being more the aggressor because he will find somebody else if he doesn't get his. Now, he's not going to get his as easily as as, as Kawhi right. does. Of course. And and that's the tricky part for the Raptors. And that's why I believe that you know, find those spots. I mean, this is this is the game 3 basically is the recipe for them. Is make the game ugly. Make it yeah, a grind. Yeah, they got they only lost. It went to double overtime, and they only lost by eight. With with Giannis not playing well, you yeah. know that's the yeah. that's the only issue I have. Yeah, no, it's it's you know the whole question is can they continue to make Giannis underperform? Essentially, make the game make the game hard for him. And then, I, uh, honestly, they should have won in regulation. Pascal Siakam has two free throws to ice it with what. Seven seconds left, 14 seconds left, and he misses, and they end up tying it up. I think it was 14 seconds. I, in, in any event, I'll be interested to see this next game. I don't know that any of it matters, because if unless Andre Iguodala is out with this knee and KD is out, 
Uh, you know, I was a guy who said the East, whoever comes out of the East is gonna gonna knock off these Warriors. What the Warriors have found, the way that Kerr has been able to find something out of his bench, getting contributions from role players that I never dreamed could stay on the floor and just give him minutes. I don't even care about the production. Just don't give up buckets. Be smart. Play into this stress. And they've done it. I mean, Jonas Terepko has given them quality minutes. Even Jordan Bell is a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a loose cannon. Kavon Looney has stepped up in a big way. I'm going to st- I'm staying with, you know, I want to see it. I'm not changing, but I am more convinced or um, I'm more open to the idea that the Warriors could get a third one now than I ever have been largely because of what they've been able to get out of the bench I just I thought that was going to be their kill I wholeheartedly agree with that I agree because based on how they are they keep rising up to the level of play I feel like the more challenging it gets the more they rise up as an entire team and because of what you said, that strategy that Steve Kerr did, he would put a guy in here, get a couple minutes here, maybe he start this game during the season yeah. to make everybody feel important. And now that's coming to fruition in these playoffs. Like right now, yeah, everyone's talking about Looney. He's, he's having these, qu- these, these key quality things that he's doing that you know people are now seeing finally in game three. But just, just like little, little details like offensive boards or – you know, maybe a key pick, maybe a key blockout, maybe you know, key buckets. Yes. And he and, and he's emotionless, and it's funny, you know, to to watch that. So uh, right now, everything's coming. And then, of course, I'm sure now everybody they're not saying it, but I know, I know for a fact that there is a major chip on that championships team shoulder because KD's out. Yeah. They see it. They see everybody saying like, "Oh, without KD, this team." Like we've been we've been doing this. I obviously yes, the bench the team was a little different, you know. Obviously with, with Harrison Barnes there and missing other players too. But I'm sure they all feel that way, and they have the right coach to to bring that out of them. So I just think from top to bottom, I mean they're 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 ready to go. And so I know some people are like, oh, if the Bucks get through, you know, the Bucks have a chance to to knock them off. And I'm like, I don't I don't see it. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we can say. Yeah, right now the Bucks are a better three-point shooting team. I get that, but what are you gonna do when they just have them flurries? Like at one point, I think I think it was Game Two where they were they scored what 15 minutes and like 15 points in like three minutes. Yeah, they when they decide, and it's not just the scoring. What it really is is the combination of the pressure they put on you defensively, and they and they they found a way to be so stifling for six seven minutes, and they've done it to the Blazers a couple times. Blazers would go up by 15, 17, and I've said, this isn't enough. You need to push it to 24, 25. Because need- they're scared. That's what the Clippers did, is, is they pushed it to 24, 25. And that's how the Warriors just couldn't come back on them. In because the- it's the fear. They know that this team can score 15 points in, at, at any given time. Yes. It's, just like, it's just like when we're playing, you know, say we're playing Aaron Rodgers. You know, there are some nah. – we, ha- we have to be so disciplined because we know – at any given moment, he can just go on a hot streak and just light us up. Right, right. Every like playing the Chargers, every every game Philip Rivers will start off. He'll probably be like twelve for twelve, just out the gate, and you can't do anything about it. Hmm. You know that's that's what's tough, and we and we know that. You know there are some there are some quarterbacks where, you know, it's like okay, he's he's probably not going to beat us by himself. But right. there are some times where okay. We have to play in Tom Brady. We have to hit Tom Brady. If there is no pass rush, we are doomed. If he can sit there, he's seen everything. He's played for almost 20 years. He's seen everything. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's, and, but defensively, I, I, they weren't this all year long. And, and they're not for 48 minutes. They can't sustain it. But they can pick their spots. And when they collectively decide to get after it, they can really make life unbearable. And then, now, is it true that yeah. if they blow a team out, they lift weights afterwards? Is that true? I heard I s- that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, what? Like as a team? No. I mean, guys will go in. I've seen guys in. But Steph, I haven't asked him, and I meant to. There's a couple of stationary bikes, like right in the locker room, 
And he's been on one of those stationary bikes after a couple of these games. This was before the finger injury and the latest, I forget what he had going on. I think it might have been before. No, it wasn't because he, he rolled the ankle early. But he was he was like on the bike after the game. I'm like, dude, you you played enough. I mean, if it's, if it's a Jordan Bell or it's a guy who's only played 10, 15, I get it. A lot of guys will go in and get a little extra conditioning if they haven't played minutes. But it's not a collective thing. But, yeah, some guys will go in afterward and get a huh. lift in. All right. Didn't have this on the agenda, but... I have uh, something. You know what? Go actually, ahead. actually, let's say... I have gonna... something on the agenda. Yes. Okay. I have something for you on the agenda. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this morning, <laughs> as most of us, I believe, were watching First Take. Yes. Oh, so you are bringing this. This is what I was going <laughs> to... This is what, what I was going to mention. Yeah. yeah. Magic said your your uh, your reports were not true. Is that right? About the, about the emails. The emails the email he said the, report? Said the emails were not true. He said Rick they said Rick Buker too. Really? They, the they mentioned me by name. <laughs> by name. Wow. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna maybe I should text this to him. I was like, you know what? No, I'm not gonna text this to him. I'm gonna bring it up. Wow, you're just gonna drop it on me. Just drop it. Yeah. Yeah. It well, I, I I mean I'm as good as my sources and I was told that now, I w- the one thing that I heard down the line was, because I continued to kind of investigate or talk to people, was whether whether Magic was CC'd on the emails or whether somebody told him about emails that were going back and forth. Uh, because my understanding is, is he doesn't spend a whole lot of time. In fact, I had one person tell me he's not even sure that I, th- I don't know if I told you this, that he's not sure that Magic has an email account, which I just find like, ugh, really? Like, he doesn't have an email account? Is that really possible in this day and age? But I do know that he has an assistant, and I do know that you can email him information. Now, whether somebody was reading it, and showed it to him, whether somebody was reading it and telling him, uh, in any event, uh, look, I can't contradict the guy who says it happened, but that I was told that that's how Magic heard that Rob Palenka, the GM, was betraying him. And I don't know. Look. No, I, b- I believe those things. I b- I'm sure that has happened. I'm sure, you know, something got word to him. I believe he did say someone told him about it. I think after you mentioned it or something like that. I don't know. But he said he's never seen any emails. Right. Okay. So. <sighs> <laughs> I wish I could see your face right now. Well, I guess this is the thing. Is... There you go again. There you go again, Rick, out there in the streets. <laughs> spreading news, man. Well, ultimately, the question we were trying to answer was... Why did he step off when the, when he stepped off as abruptly as he stepped off? And in essence, he is saying it's because he learned that Palinka was talking about him behind his back. Now, if it wasn't in emails or he didn't see the email, the details of that, did I get them wrong? Okay, I, I, may have got, I may have got that wrong. The essence of what it was in the emails or what he was, and I still think, honestly, from, from where I got it, I still believe that there were emails that, that Rob was sending. I don't think this was like, <sighs> Rob was talking to somebody and they overheard it in the hallway and then they went back to magic and they told him like, my sense is, I'm, I'm still, again, I still believe that there were emails. Whether he was CC'd on them or his, his assistant was CC'd on them and she told him about them, I'm going to stand by that part of the story. I agree, yeah. I, I feel you on that. So, but it's I, just interesting wanted to, the, I just wanted to bring that up. It was interesting. Oh, Yeah, yeah, yeah well, ahead. and look. That's I, I find it very interesting that they decided to bring my name up 
Because well, it, it sounds as if yeah, magic. St- Stephen A. brought it up. He brought it up. You know, it was almost like a, it was like a sit down when he was on first take. You know, Stephen A. had the floor. He's the basketball guy on the show. Right. And part of it was, you know, hey, we heard through Rick Buecher <laughs> when he mentioned well, the email. So, the, I, and I will say, this is also this is a thing that now happens in the media a lot, which is we try to assassinate each other. Like if somebody gets a, something, no, it wasn't assassination though. In that regards, it was just he just brought it up. Okay, because because he was actually putting pressure on Magic. Like, hey, like right. there are these things. Like, what's up? Right. So, you know, anyhow, and not having seen it, I, I I probably should see it before. That's why I wasn't going to bring it up until the next podcast because I haven't seen it. Well, that's good though, because now we can wait for your reaction. <laughs> Once I see it, yeah, probably yeah. should have waited. It's all good. <laughs> In any event, uh, I do have some extra news, though. I have an announcement to make. Okay. So, um, in my lovely, wonderful state of Rhode Island, I have been uh, elected into our state hall of fame. I feel great. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. I'm actually, I'm really excited about that. That's so pretty cool. When's the ceremony? Uh, it's not till October. Okay. But um, Very they cool. said you would have. They said you would have been in it a long time ago, but you you wouldn't retire. So. <laughs> Good for you, because their ceremonies in October, and I'm always playing that time. So yeah, yeah, it's cool. it's it's exciting. Yeah, I'm fired up about that. Who are you going in with, dude? I forget. Actually, you know, John Galuli. He's he's actually one of our um, one of the journalists for for the Providence Journal. Mm-hmm. He's going in with me as well. And then uh, Boucher, he played hockey. Hmm. He's going in there too. Some people suggest that I should pronounce my last name that way. No, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a French ring. Wow, congratulations. Is there a, like a physical Hall of Fame, Rhode Island Hall of Fame? I have no idea. Mm. The Tennis Hall of Fame is in Rhode Island. I know that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Little tidbits. So there, you said, is there a physical Hall of Fame in Rhode Island? Yes, the Tennis Hall of Fame is in Rhode you Island. Go. You know what I meant, the State Hall of Fame. All right, a uh, couple of things I wanted to get to here. Uh, Tyreek Evans uh, with the Indiana Pacers has been basically banned from the NBA it's for violating their drug policy. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is largely because leagues are very circumspect about giving They're the details. About the given details, you said? Yes, of what transpired, what the guy did. And I don't know if that helps or hurts. I get that you know, various factions don't want the details disclosed. But I just wonder, like I, the the mystery almost makes it worse for Tyreek. And being banned from the league is is certainly bad enough. Um, but as a as a player, and and this is a, an issue that all of the players' unions and the leagues kind of go through in in various ways in terms of how to handle um, drug policy and drug disclosure and all of that. What what's your feeling about how, the best way to handle that? As a now, I don't I don't player. know how the NBA works. I know in the NFL, um, you go into an actual program. If you are you know you tested positive for let's say you know a street drug whatever you do you do go into a program. You are monitored. You do have to give get tested you know a couple times or wherever it is. But you are in a program. It's almost like um, like parole. Mm-hmm if you will. Mm -hmm. So I do know you're in the program. So now, Hey, let's be more responsible so that you can get out of the program. I don't know the NBA, how that works. Maybe he was in the program and got busted again, you know, so that I don't know. Now, if he was, if he was in a NBA, you know, street substance abuse program and he got tested positive again, then that's kind of like, come on, dude, that's kind of like what happened with Josh Gordon. He was in the program and he, kept failing drug tests and so i understand in that regards so i i don't i don't know the full extent of how the nba works with that i don't know if you do yeah well when you're first in the program they don't acknowledge it so the first time you have a violation you're put into a program you're basically sent to rehab or you have certain requirements that you have to fulfill but there's no suspension there's no announcement there's no there's no 
public punishment or uh, announcement as far as your violation. And then right. you, you have to have a number of those before they get to the point where, okay, we're announcing a suspension, we're announcing why, and then if you have all that, and then you get banned. Now, this is a little unique in the suspicion, and this again, this is, goes to the heart of my question, because or what I find intriguing about the subject is that being accused or, or being banned means that you were using drugs of abuse, as they like to say. And it wasn't like performance-enhancing drugs per se. It was heroin, cocaine. There's, there's a list of, of drugs that fall under that heading that get you banned. And you can also get banned from pr- repeated use, but I, I think there's, if I remember the, the reading correctly or the way it's written, the drugs of abuse, like it's, you test positive for one of those, you're gone right away. And that was implemented because of the huge cocaine problem that, that the NBA had at right. the time. So this is where like the, the uncertainty of why he's been banned, I think works against him in terms of, you know, is he shooting up heroin? Like, what's he doing? And, exactly. And- what is it exactly? Because right now the consensus is like, oh, he got banned for marijuana. It's like, come on, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because yeah. that's what, um, same thing happened. Was it, who's in Taiwan? Ma- OJ Mayo is in Taiwan, right? He's, he got banned too. Yes. For substance abuse. Yes. And nothing's, we never got any understanding or clarification on that either. And I feel like, you know, there's this black cloud over over OJ Mayo simply because we don't know. By the way, he is eligible for reinstatement in two years, so it's not like a lifetime. Ban. Yeah, but he's gonna be what thirty two by then. Yeah, no, two years out of the league. Yeah, and he's he's made you know almost eighty million dollars, dude. He's, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. So he's never he had never been previously suspended from the league for any drug related offenses. Which is what leads everybody to believe that he was, uh, that this was uh, the use of a drug of abuse. And the list of drugs uh, of abuse are amphetamines and similar uh, benzodiazepines. I don't know what that, those are, (laughs) I don't know what those are. Cocaine. That's a good thing. GHB, ketamine, LSD, opiates, and PCP. So, yeah. All right. The other thing, and this kind of ties into it, which is Kareem Hunt and his baptism. For those who may not know, you know, Kareem Hunt obviously was let go by the Kansas City Chiefs. It was done so because he wasn't uh, honest about an incident with a woman in a hotel. And then video came out of him, uh, you know, kicking her and hitting her. And they summarily let him go. And then Cleveland signed him, and now he was baptized the other day into a Baptist church, no less. And John Dorsey and Freddie Kitchens both showed up. And this is this is the struggle I have, Will, because I am I believe in second chances. I believe, especially young guys, I believe they can turn things around. I think they can recognize that we all can do stupid things when we're young and realize what we're risking and how wrong it is, the, the behavior that we indulged in. But I struggle, I struggle when it becomes, when I feel as if religion or finding religion becomes, when it feels like a prop in any way. I, I, you know, I, I don't know that getting baptized, I don't know that, that having that in itself, the act in itself, to me, doesn't change anybody. It's what that symbolizes and signifies. And I guess there's a part of me that the advertisement of this... It's the advertisement. Yeah, that's what makes me skeptical and, and cynical, and it, it, it just feels like a prop. It feels like... Okay, I like don't what is it what am I supposed to take from this? Am I supposed to believe that you're a changed man? Show me that you're a changed man. 
don't tell me that you want to or that you're taking whatever it might be. You know, yeah, somebody... it's 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 always from here and out. No question about it. I think all this is I think is genuine. Just based on for the fact that okay, John Dorsey he drafted Kareem Hunt when he was in Kansas City, and then Kareem Hunt goes through all this trouble. Now keep in mind when when John Dorsey drafted him, he knew everything about him. He knew, especially in terms of the extent of, you know, when you get drafted, they want to know everything about you. Something as small as like I had a when I had my physical at the combine, they they found out I had a, I fractured my ankle when I was like thirteen. Hmm. You know, they knew about that stuff. So they even know everything about my family. So when Kareem Hunt, I'm sure going through the process, John Dorsey knew his family history. He knew his his brother has been arrested before. He knew his father has been arrested what, 35 times for domestic abuse situation. He knew his his aunt was also arrested for voluntary manslaughter. He knew all this stuff hmm. in terms of his history. So, but I think John still sees like there's something there's something like in this kid, you know, where he's a good kid somewhere in there. Yeah. Something about it. I, I don't think it's just a matter of like, oh, we're trying to load up on football players, regardless of what they, what they dealing with. We'll figure out to, figure a way to fix that, you know. And he he knew something about him, and I truly feel like, you know, Kareem Hunt is trying to make the right steps. Now, obviously, yes, the advertisement is what makes it okay, dude. Like, all right, you're trying to get baptized and let right. us know your change today. It's like, nah, dude, we we need it. For for a long long time, like Mike, Michael Vick went through the ringer with the whole dog thing, right? He went through it, and he had to constantly do everything in his power to let people know, like, hey, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. Same thing with Michael, well, Vick. That's what he grew up in. That's all he knew. Yeah, that was that was normal. That was like going to play catch. Was watching dog fights. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so the same deal in that, in that regards. Like he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. Right. He knew he knew it was kind of he knew it was messed up because it was violent, but he didn't think like okay, everyone's been doing this. Right. Right. You know. Well, and um, and that that happens. I feel as if that happens a lot with guys. So you take guys from various cultures and you put them in the spotlight of being a pro athlete, and then you also keep them in a bubble where everything is kind of taken care of and they're protected in a lot of ways and they stay inside that bubble and they do get away with stuff that the average guy on the street couldn't get away with and so th there becomes this belief that i don't have to play by the same rules that everybody else plays by i've seen right. plenty of people i've seen people in the media get caught up in that when you're when you're in a sphere with NBA, NFL, whatever it might be, like you live in that world and you suddenly, you know, step out of it or rub up against the real world and suddenly get into trouble or the, or the, the, the curtains pulled back and it's like, wait a minute. I mean, I never, never forget in talking to uh, Aubrey Huff from the San Francisco Giants. I did a radio show for just a couple months with him <laughs> in San Francisco before he decided that doing a 6 a.m. radio morning show was just not was not for him. And he told me about taking Adderall in baseball and what it did for him and how easy it was to get a prescription for it and that he was taking it all the time. He basically got hooked on Adderall. And what it did for him, and like he could be hung over, or he could do whatever, and he would take the Adderall, and like he would be focused, and like it would, it did great things for him. Now that, that was, was like that, it was like that movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper, whatever it was called. <laughs> he that, he took this pill, and he just locked in. Yeah, that was it. And that, and and Huff was doing that on a regular basis, and he talked about how easy it was uh, to get that. And so I thought. Yeah, and look, actually, you know, when it comes to opioids, we got we got we do have issues with that in society at large. But the difference is people are paying huge prices for that in a multitude of ways, whether it's getting incarcerated or it's, you know, not having the safety net that that a professional athlete has and people trying to keep them on on the beam. And so I just feel as if people begin to think that they're above it. 
or beyond it. And then suddenly they find out they're not. And it's a it's a really rude awakening. But the 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 culture and the sphere is built almost for people to buy into that idea that I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. That's that's what regular people have to worry about. Because an athlete can be so valuable in the unique things that he does. And I just, you know, I don't I'm not putting Kareem Hunt I think the skepticism is that's why Kareem Hunt is being saved by the Cleveland Browns. Not necessarily because John Dorsey sees something good in him to salvage, aside from being a great player, but simply because he's a great player and we could always use more great players. You think that's what it is? I'd, I'd like to think it's not. And, and I give John Dorsey this because he looked into Baker Mayfield. He's looked into a couple guys – and he's seen something that other people haven't seen. And he's created a culture that's changing the Cleveland Browns. So I'd like to believe that. But the, the baptism and the advertisement of the baptism, take, and, and John Dorsey and Freddie Kitchen showing up and having their photos taken, I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, you want to show up, you want to support your guy. It's easy enough for you to say, and it's one thing if somebody catches a photo, like you get one of these these candid, somebody catches you walking into the church or whatever, and okay, that's tough to avoid in this day and age. But if you're posing for a photo, then you know there's a very good chance that this is going to get out or that somebody's going to write a story or whatever. Right. That's not what this should be about. That that to me is you're taking part in the in the prop. Yeah. I think it's all interesting too. You know, he he goes back to the Browns. You know, they're in Berea, which is forty minutes from his hometown. You know, Kareem's from Ohio, mm. and he went to Toledo. Mm. I don't know. I think it's. I don't. I don't. I know John Dorsey, and I'm sure he's seen everything. He's seen people go through stuff, and like I said, that I know it's too soon to tell. And write all the the props and the pictures, the social media posts with everybody and announcing that he's done this right you prefer that it's you know that he does it behind closed doors and takes care of himself however you know you have the the small percenters the minority like me that i'm like okay i see what everyone else is seeing in terms of what he's doing but i have something in me where i can okay i seen it i've seen it before i've seen guys who you know had a you know dark past or have demons or have things they deal with and there's something in them where, you know, if they are just around the right people, the, the right environment, who can prevail? And as you saw, I mean, even his his mother was arrested in 2014 for, I think it was cocaine possession. So there's like no one in the in his family. And that the one person who took a chance on him, who believed him, believed in him, is John Dorsey. Yeah. You know. So it's like, hey, hey, I'm a. I'm going I'm to do this again and, and see what happens. And, and it may and it may work out and it may not. You know, I was in Jacksonville with Justin Blackman when he dealt with his, you know, addictions and his issues and his demons. And Dave Caldwell and Shah Khan and Gus Bradley did everything in their power to help him out. And, yeah, it, it just it just didn't work out. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. All right. That does it for this episode of Buker and Blackman, subsidiary Buker and Friends, part of the United WeCast Network. Uh, Keep in mind, we need, I think we just need a couple of reviews and then we will, I mean, I mean, a couple, like two or three, and then we'll be able to have our drawing for uh, prizes. So wherever you get your podcast, iTunes or wherever, please rate the show and then screenshot that to us at Buker Friends and you'll be eligible for those prizes. In the next podcast, yes, we will continue the discussion about what Magic said about me and my report on, or what he said on first take about my report about how he found out that Rob Palenka was allegedly working against him. Uh, I also want to get into, we mentioned the situation with Kareem Hunt and Tyreek Evans, Chad Kelly getting another crack with the Colts. Ruben Foster in Washington. There's a lot of guys in the news kind of are still part of this this conversation about the bubble and second chances and all of that. So Chris can, Ballard was also on the Chiefs with John Dorsey. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So 
all that in the next podcast. In the meantime, as oh yeah, we'll get into uh, Warriors Blazers. Can the Warriors complete the sweep? And if they do so without KD, they win a championship without KD. What does it mean? All that in the next podcast. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening.